maybe you play original Dungeons and Dragons. There it is, Men and Magic, which includes, of course, chainmail. Because if you're not using chainmail, you're missing one of the pieces of the game. Parts of equipment, chainmail, miniature rules. Look at this latest edition. He's like, I don't know, I'm on two, three, four, five. I don't think they ever did four and five. Hey, maybe you play basic and expert. Maybe you graduated to big boy D&D with AD&D. Or maybe you play a lesser version. But since you're on YouTube, there's a very good chance that you watch RPG videos and you have been following recent conversations. I hate to say discoveries. It's not really discoveries. This stuff has been known, but... We're going through a renaissance in looking at the early days of D&D. Now, if you are the guy that owns the brand, you're the IP holder, and you're corporate America, you're doing everything you can to rewrite the history and try to erase Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax from it. But if you are at all a student of history, if you're at all curious about how this humble little war game, Chainmail, blossomed into... The yards after yards after yards of books, the billion-dollar industry. If you want to know how we went from miniature war games to role-playing games, this is a great way to learn about that. A lot of the bigger channels are slowly catching up on this, and they understand that there's a transition period called a Bronstein, where you had these medieval war games, and instead of taking on the role of just a general and commanding troops on the battlefield, a guy named David Wesley said, hey, what if you took on the role of like a spy or, or a recruiter or the head of a university that's responsible for deciding which way the community is going to go? Whole new thing. And if you are following the conversation, you know that it was David Arneson that said, hey, I'm actually going to do it, Mr. Wesley. I'm going to marry your style of game, it's called a Brownstein, with the miniature war game. And you can see that going on right here in Blackmoor Foundations. Or you can watch the documentary, Secrets of Blackmoor. This is by one of the leading lights who is pursuing this, this line of inquiry. His name is Griffith M. Morgan III. And he's got a whole bunch of documentation from Dave Arneson, who, again, just to remind you, this is original D&D, by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. Don't let the official court historians delete their names. Get a copy of this. Read about it, because it's really interesting to see how Dave Arneson himself evolved his game from the medieval Bronstein to the first role-playing game. And here's the notice. There will be a medieval Bronstein April 17th, 1970, at the home of Dave Arneson. From 1 in the afternoon to midnight, oh man, 11-hour game sessions, brutal, baby, brutal. And this was after the meeting of the Napoleonic Society. That's a whole day of gaming, man. That's like a, like a one-man machine. That's like a one-man convention. Very impressive stuff. The point is, if you've been watching this conversation going on and you're curious about it, most of the guys who talk about these things will tell you, well, you can play in a Bronstein. In fact, you can play in David Wesley. He'll run the Bronstein for you. He had a couple more. There was uh, one called oh, Banania, which was kind of a Banana Republic one. And Dave Arneson won it, by the way. Even though there were no real victory conditions, he still managed to find a way to win it. That's how impressive the, the man was when it came to playing games. But I'm here to tell you that you can play these at your table. And today's video, that's a long preamble, but today's video is to tell you how to implement the Bronstein style of play at your table, even with players who don't really know what you're doing. Because let's face it, going from the traditional view of role-playing games, I'm the DM, and I have created this world, and you have to run around in it and guess what I want you to do, because there's an important story I want to tell. Uh, boring. I really need to do a whole video, on an another video on this book. There's a whole lot more stuff in here. That's not how the Brownstein works. It's not the DM on this side of the table and the players on that side of the table. The Brownstein grew out of, and I think I... I think I dog-eared this, yeah. Arneson's Blackmoor was planned as a campaign that fell under the greater umbrella of the Castle and Crusade Society, an organization for medieval wargaming and history buffs. The military campaigns planned by this group had local game clubs conducting activities within their chosen area. 
In some cases, one group could ask that another group have their players act as proxies for these military incursions between groups located far apart from each other. So you have players that are going against each other. They're playing a PvP style, which it's a war game. Of course you are. This was not the get-along gang situation. They were perfectly comfortable going head-to-head and getting up to all sorts of hijinks. If you go back and read Tony Beth's setting up an, uh, is it setting up an ancient war game campaign, you'll find that he was doing something very similar at roughly the same time. I think there's probably some cost pollinization going on there, but the important thing is, these guys are no strangers to PvP, and although we generally look down on that right now, PvP creates some really complicated, convoluted situations, which are often more complicated than a single individual can create. The kind of situations that you see in something like Game of Thrones, where you've got multiple leaders who are all competing for the one big throne that sits empty. So you have shifting alliances, and you have assassinations, and you have people bribing other people to do this, that, and the other, and they're trading favors. Great stuff. No one can come up with all that. Not even George R.R. Martin could do that. He actually, we all know at this point, that he stole most of the plot from the War of the Roses. I embellished it and made it fantasy. I'm not coming down on the guy for not creating all this stuff. The point is... The more variables you have and the more creative minds you have dumping into the situation, the better the game that results. So the real question, though, is, hey, Mr. Wargaming, I'd really like to try this, but I don't know that my players are on board with it. I'm a little concerned about whether or not they're going to agree to play this style of game. No problem. I've got the solution for you. What we are going to do is we are going to boil the frog slowly. We are going to introduce elements of a Bronstein to your current campaign in a very slow and measured and methodical way. And in a way that your players won't even really know what's going on until it's too late. I don't know what's going on in your campaign. I can't give you specific instructions. I can just give you kind of some generalities. First of all, I'm assuming that you're doing a sandbox campaign. If you have a linear story, this won't work because you as the DM are the author of that story and your players are just along for the ride. That's not how we do things when it comes to a Bronstein. You're giving the players the opportunity to affect real long-term impacts on the campaign. Got to be, at a minimum, a sandbox. Maybe you're using stop time. Maybe you're not. Doesn't really matter. You're going to have to move off a stop time eventually. But we're not going to start with one-to-one time. That's a heavy lift. For those of you that don't know, one-to-one time says simply, for every day that passes in the real world, one day passes in the game world. It's a means of helping you manage your Bronstein, helping you manage your PvP campaign. So what I'm going to do is set up a very simple sandbox campaign, the kind of thing that you tinker with all the time. And we're going to start with a human city right here in the center. And it's a typical human medieval city. It's got a king, it's got barons, it's got whatever. Okay, so we have our, our humans, and there's going to be a thieves' guild, and there's going to be the king and his, or maybe we'll call it a barony, okay? Because that way we've got a baron with his his army. And of course, we've got the religious guys. So these are the three human factions that are at play in your little sandbox. Out here, we have a goblin camp. And over here, we have some dwarves. And they're doing mining, okay? And the the goblins are moving in, and they're they're hoping to start raiding the outlying farms. And so then we have the the tombs over here, where you've got the, the necromancer all right and he's slowly raising up an army and then we need one more so let's just go with the classic we've got the elves who are of course up to no good or maybe they're up to some good who knows and maybe there's even a little druid grotto here and of course we've got some standalone caves out here on the edge where your players are typically going there's some ruins too just so okay look we got ourselves a little sandbox right Ruins of the old imperial city that, you know, there's bad stuff down there. So we have some dungeons. And because you're running a sandbox or, like I said, maybe even a West Marches-style campaign, whoever shows up gets to go 
do stuff and your players have started to explore and in your mind you have to worry about what the druid grotto is what's going on with the druids you know the the druids like the elves and do the elves like the dwarves or are they fighting over some gems you know some some tolkienian gems what about the goblins right what are they up to and then what's what's this this undead faction guys up to and so your players are running around and and you know maybe these dungeons have a theme maybe they don't but here's how we're going to slowly introduce a Brownstein into your campaign. So the goblins, you've already, like I said, this is a sandbox. So they've got a specific roster. Maybe they're riding spiders, giant spiders, right? But they want something. What are they after? Are they actually looking? Did the dwarves chase them out of their homes? And they're, we're doing like a reverse uh, 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 drums in the deep where the, the dwarves have taken over the goblin mines and the goblins are trying to get it back. Well, the goblins might actually kind of work their way around here and say to the elves, I know you want that gem. I'm going to help you kick the dwarves out and then I get to keep the rest of the mines and you get the big pretty jewels that fell off the magic trees at the bottom of the mine, right? Now, that's the kind of thing you as the DM would come up with. Your players interfere because they go hit the goblin camp and the goblins are hurting pretty bad because the players stole some of their stuff. So here's the question that you face. The session is over. It's a regular bog standard session. Your players went out and they explored and they found the goblin camp. This is pretty typical, the kind of thing that goes on in campaigns all the time. They made it back home. So now the question is, how do the goblins respond? And this is where the magic begins. In a normal campaign, you would have to think about what the goblins do. But in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to ask one of the players, hey, just, so the session's over, by the way. We've handed out experience points, and everybody's gone home. Are you going to pick up the phone, or are you going to shoot a little text, a little direct message to one of the players? And you're going to say, hey... You know, I, I got to tell you, you know, I, I'm a little, I'm not sure how the goblins are going to respond to your raid. What do you think they should do? Your player will be like, wait, what? Well, I mean, you're, and, and you just kind of sweet talk them a little bit. You say, listen, you know about this game. You know how it works really well. I mean, if you were the goblins and you had, you know, this kind of stuff, and you don't have to give up all the, the mysteries, you can just give them a rough idea. You know, they, you know, they got some spider, they got a couple of shamans. You know, they have one ogre, but, you know, he's kind of valuable. You know, what would they do now that they're hurting real bad? Do you think that they would go off and look for help and borrow some skeletons? Or do you think they'd go talk to the dwarves? And that's it. You just ask them, what would they do? And you, would they stage a raid on an outlying farm and leave some dwarf weapons around so it looks like the dwarves did it? You get to tell the player, listen, you're a role player, so I need you to engage in the player knowledge Versus the character knowledge. Because whatever you think they're going to do, I'm, I'm probably going to use that idea. And then you have another session. And maybe your players come across that, that farm that the goblins raided and left a bunch of dwarf weapons. And the players say, wait a minute, that's really weird. Why would the dwarves attack this farm? The players all have a mystery. Now, one of your players knows, but he's not going to say anything, right? Because he's, he's a role player. He's, I'm now playing the role of one of the PCs. If he's not at the session, that's even better. At this point, this situation is going to change a little bit. And you have to pick up the phone and you call that friend to say, hey, so the goblins did the thing and it looks like it worked because these people went over and raised a ruckus with the dwarves or whatever the case may be. And so then, the next week, you pick a different player and you say, hey, by the way, what do you think the Dwarf King would do now that he's been wrongfully accused of burning this, this farm to the ground? Like, if he was wrongfully accused, you don't even have to tell him that that's what happened. You just say, hey, what do you reckon that, that, that King Ironbeard, what is he going to do? And then as the situation develops, every time you, as the DM, have to decide how the Dwarves are going to respond, you just ask one of the, you just ask that same player. And then with every answer he gives you, you give him a little more information. You might even be so bold, so daring, so creative as to tell him, hey, I, I haven't actually mapped out the dwarven mines. I did map out what they looked like when the goblins lived there. But he, here's the map of the dwarven mines. Can you just sketch out what the dwarven, like, 
catacombs? You know, they're new mines. Did they go down? Did they go out? Like, what kind of shafts and analysis? Can you go ahead and map that and then just, like, kick it back to me? You're letting your player create some of the world for you. You're taking some of the burden. You're taking a lot of the burden off your shoulders. You no longer have to decide. Uh, what, what are we here? We just threw down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, eight factions here onto the table. And that is, I, I, I can't remember how the math works out. Like, like, but it's, it's thousands of different possibilities for the alliances that can occur here. You've taken it off your shoulders. You don't have to decide all of that. For every one of these that you take off your shoulders and throw onto the players, trick the players into managing, you've simplified your life. Now you don't have to manage all of the different relationships. You're letting your players do that. And if you're using stop time, that's fine because these people are still going to be doing things away from the players. And you can manage this okay even using stop time, because when time stops, it stops for everyone. But a lot of these plans are going to take time to develop. So if the elves and the druid, the, maybe the druid saw our little faked crime over here, and he mentioned to the elves, and the elves are going to tell the dwarves what happened, and the dwarves are going to come here, and they're going to ask the baron for help, but the goblins have already bribed the thieves' guild to spread rumors that it was the elves that faked the doors. So now the players, nobody's going to have the entire puzzle. They're, gonna, they're not going to be able to see the entire picture. The only one who should see most of the picture is you. And here's where the game gets even more fun. You, as the DM, won't have all of the picture. Because just as happened to Dave Wesley, when Dave Arneson was in his basement, his own basement, and he said to one of the other players, hey, come over here, i got to talk to you. And he started making plans that he didn't tell Dave Wesley about. And when those plans came to fruition, I think one of the things was a duel. And Wesley was like, I didn't make up any rules for a duel. I don't know, you use this game over here. He was very surprised. You, as the DM, now get to be surprised by what this map looks like. But you also get to be surprised by the under-the-table negotiations. It turns out the druid and the undead guy are working together in a way that the goblins don't realize. And you don't realize that until their trap is sprung. Now, there will there may come a day where there will be a little bit of retcon. These guys did a thing, and the other player says, oh, wait a minute, I had a contingency for that. Because I'm working with these guys so that when that happens, we can make sure to stop it because we have this in place. And maybe they even tell you that. So you can be the one to spring it. Oh, they were ready for that? And here's how they went about stopping it. Here was the plans, the orders that they gave me for that eventuality. And they'll be shocked. And they'll think, wow, you're a really clever DM. And they may not even know that the rest of these factions are being piloted by one of the other players. All of them will know there's at least one. And the smart ones will go, well, geez, if he's got me driving the goblins, then he probably has somebody else driving the dwarves. That's going to lead to an increased amount of paranoia on their part as they play out this game. The benefits of dumping a Bronstein into your game are incalculable. This is an entirely new way to play. And it is, as I said, a very difficult shift to make. Not many players can make that quantum leap from pure story point A to point B to, oh my gosh, I've got a tangled web of deception that I have to try to root through. This has so many more axes of variables on it, but because your players are directing things in ways they never have before, because they now get to see their own plans come to fruition, because they now get to play multiple roles within this campaign, they're going to take a much less combative attitude when it comes to their special snowflake character that they've already mapped out from level 1 to level 20 and all the feet chains and all of that, because that's just one of the little variables that they're steering through this sandbox. They are also managing this entire faction, and they may have a plan for their regularly scheduled PC is busy, and they may say, I need another PC that can handle this other business with my faction. I sat down to edit this video, and it occurred to me at this point that I probably should mention, although I've used 
Dungeons and Dragons as the intro and kind of a generic fantasy setting as the example, these same principles apply in any genre you care to name. Gangbusters is explicitly and expressly designed to run this kind of campaign. Boot Hill, also, if you look at it through these eyes, you'll see that Bronstein peeking through. Call of Cthulhu could be amazing. We've done videos on that before. Traveler is not quite written for this, but it works great. Any planet that you care to name, you can drop multiple factions into. And even some of the imperial politics within a given subsector, you can run that. Heck, even Ghostbusters would work for this, I think. Although I've never played that. I think you see where this is going. Now, I, I keep using the term Bronstein because it very closely mimics the style. I, I should probably be saying Brownstone because from everything I've seen, the second ever Bronstein that was run was a Wild West. Dave Arneson played a guy. I just found out about this in, in this book, Blackmore Foundations, that he Arneson was playing a guy named El Poncho, who was kind of... a reskinned version of Pancho Villa. And that, if you watch Blackmore, Secrets of Blackmore, the guy running it was was sick of it. He was like, I keep getting all these calls at all hours of the day. People saying, what's going on? What are we doing? How, who's doing what? I tried to do this thing. Did it work? Did it not work? They were running over the course of several weeks. And apparently from this book makes it sound like they kind of started and stopped. But a very strange thing happened. When they started playing this Bronstein style of play, the game never ended. Sessions started to become focal points for very important changes in the stability of the political structure, but it became a political game, and it stayed a role-playing game. You can do this in your campaign. Maybe not in a linear campaign, but those are those are passe. I, nobody does those except for the clowns at Watsi. You're probably doing one more like this. And if you really want to take this to the next level, do what Arneson did. Embrace PvP. And as I said, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to change people's mindset in one go. You can just slowly turn up the temperature, just a little bit at a time. One of the other things you can do, if you want to trick people into playing in your campaign that aren't even ever at the table... Talk to one of your friends that you play an entirely different game with and just lay out the situation and say, this is what my players are doing in here. What would you do if you were the Goblin King? And then keep coming back to him and hounding him. Hey, the Goblin King has to deal with this decision. And you may even just give him three choices. The Goblin King has these three choices. Which one is he going to do? You're going to be surprised by the decision that your friend, who's not even sitting at the table ever, makes. You get two or three guys doing that, Oh, it's amazing. Eventually, your pe your players may glom onto that, and I can almost guarantee they're gonna beg. Oh, let me run! Let me run on dead guy! Let me run the druid grove! Right, this is probably like a dozen druids with lots of bees ready to stick on in cages on people's heads because that's the kind of thing those 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 grotty druids did in their grotty grottos. I, I listen. You, you get the idea. You don't have to set this whole elaborate university on the edge of the Franks and the Prussians at the dawn of the Franco-Prussian War, you can take your game and just add a little bit of, add a little bit of spice. Joe, what are they doing? Add a little bit more the next week and a little more the next week. And before you know it, you'll be playing in the kind of campaign that you've dreamed of for years. It's not hard. Just start small and I think eventually you will want to go one-to-one -one time just because it, it's the one variable that that's the one it's the one resource that everyone gets the same amount of at the same rate. And it will open up that uh that axis of time for these slow going campaigns. Oh, the goblins, we got hit hard. Okay, we're gonna dedicate everything to building a palisade. Your players come back two weeks later. There's a wooden palisade. Oh, those guys are clever. Maybe we don't want to hit them after all. Time becomes of the essence. Maybe we better hurry and get them before that palisade is complete. Right? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So I, you get the idea. I'm out. Till next time. I'm praying for you.